I'm very glad to introduce our speaker today, Oleg Ruchaisky. He got his PhD at the University of Chicago in 2003. He spent several years at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Paris, France, uh, as a William Hodge Fellow and Marie Curie Fellow before becoming a CERN Fellow uh, for a couple of years in uh, Geneva. Uh, he became a Senior Research Scientist at the Institute for Theoretical F Physics, EPFL, Lausanne. Switzerland in 2007, and he is an associate professor at Niels Bohr Institute since 2016. He is working on many different uh, topics uh, related to cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, he will uh, present some, uh, top, uh, some uh, presentation about the um, sterile neutrinos today. I've heard similar ideas presented in recent years. There is a huge interest in this topic as it is having a potential to resolve many problems in cosmology and particle physics. So with that, I'll give the microphone to Oleg and welcome. You may start. Thanks again. Um, indeed, it's, um, you're organizing a very nice colloquium and yes, I mean, there's all this unfortunate events. Uh, we finally established the extended network of uh, seminars when you can join people all over the world. So it's 9 a.m. in Arizona, it's 6 p.m. here in Copenhagen, and people from all, all over the world can join, and that's a lovely part of it. So I will be speaking about um, kind of a story in particle physics and cosmology, which, on which I've worked for many years, for more than a decade. And and goes on the name of Stereo Neutrinos, and uh, it has an ambition to be, to be a unifying theory between particle physics and cosmology. So to tell the story in somewhat narrative fashion, let me start from once upon a time. So there used to be a time when the particle physics was very simple. There were three particles, one interaction, it was seemingly enough to describe atoms. And if it were not for the radioactivity of the atoms, the story would be over at the beginning of the 20th century. However, the attempts to understand what radioactivity is led to the ideas that new particles should exist, these particles were predicted, these particles were searched for, these particles were discovered, and fast forward half a century, People are trying to make sense for those particles which appear, that are predicted. And in some moment, uh, Steven Weinberg writing the most cited paper of particle physics, writes in this paper. Of course, the model has too many arbitrary features for this prediction to be taken very seriously. So he puts forward an idea of how to unify this whole story, yet he is puzzled by the fact how complex and uh, unexpected the things are. And so another half century forward, and we are in a situation when this model with too many arbitrary parameters to be taken seriously is called the standard model of elementary particles. It contains 17 particles. And um, with LHC finishing two runs, it produces a beautiful result, which many of you have seen probably, it's a number of various predictions, various production of decay channels on the x-axis and cross-section of these events. And there are kind of two striking features of this plot. That's why it's called stairway to heaven. First of all, between the smallest and largest numbers, there are 14 orders of magnitude. So we can have a predictions which are running over such a vast decay. So the cross-section, the event which happens once at this end happens uh, 100 billion trillion times here. And another thing is that uh, on this plot, there are theoretical predictions that are in gray and uh, experimental confirmations that they are in color. And when you see this plot, even if I will zoom in the full screen, most of the time you don't see the difference, which shows you how exact our predictions are as of today. And that's a very striking success of a standard model, and that's why it's called standard model. And today, all the major predictions, all the particles predicted for the standard model have been finally found, with Higgs being one such particles. 
And uh, you may say that we finally, in 2012, we finally closed the theory of uh, beta decay, which started in 1920s and 1930s. However, along uh, these lines, we also find out that some of the phenomena which we observe in nature do not find their explanations within the standard model. And they are known as a beyond the standard model or BSM phenomena. And let me say very briefly about them because I will be presenting for you an idea of how to address them. So the first idea is a, the story of neutrino masses and oscillations. Unlike other leptons, neutrinos change their flavors. And unlike all other particles, uh, we know that they are massive, but we don't know what their mass is. And if you try to think about this, and again, I will speak in more details about this, you will see that neutrino oscillations and mediation of neutrino oscillations is most probably a fact that more particles, new particles should exist. And we don't know what these particles are. And there is a huge community of people working on this, this thousands of tens of thousands of papers written on the subject. And in standard model, neutrinos are massless and don't oscillate. The BSM problem number two doesn't, is not a particle physics problem. It, it's an interface of a particle physics and cosmology. When people tried to apply laws of physics to the universe as a whole, they were extremely successful in this. The hot Big Bang theory is the idea of expanding universe, the predictions of cosmic microwave background, of primordial element abundances came from this daring attempt to say, okay, the laws of, the na of nature are everywhere, the same everywhere in the universe. And with this attempt, again, very successful, many, with many predictions, which were confirmed, people also noticed that universe has matter, but has no primordial antimatter. All the antimatter we see in the cosmic rays is consistent with being secondary. And the question from, where did the, I mean, for the antimatter to be absent in the universe, this means that somewhere when in the early times when the universe was hot and dense, some of the particles and antiparticles should be unbalanced. You should have one from billion more particles and antiparticles. Then when everything annihilates, you are left with an excess. And we are made of the success. And stars are made of the success and more or less every visible matter is made of the success. And we know that physics up to small CP violations is matter and matter symmetric. And so this is something due to some particles and maybe due to some non-equilibrium processes which created the smaller symmetry. And this something is not a part of the standard model. It can be discussed, but if you desire, but um, the short answer is within a standard model, you would not be able to account for such a large baryon asymmetry, matter asymmetry as we see today. And so new particles are needed to explain what, what, this, what, this has, what caused this. The basic problem number three, number three is a dark matter problem. The fact that you see through various tracers much more matter than you can observe, much more gravitating matter that you can observe from matter that emits lights on all other detectable radiation. And this is, there are many phenomena which are called dark matter. It's not an experiment, it's not an observation. There are phenomena which explain how, that demonstrate for you that galaxies have more mass than we can account for, that clusters of galaxies have more mass. The whole cosmology sits on the fact that there is some substance in the universe which drives in the expansion, yet it is not coupled to photons around the redshift of uh, last scattering. And so all this together is known as dark matter. And most probably it's uh, like the, the dominant hypo hypothesis that this is a particle. And what is this particle? We don't know. And so there are many attempts. And I put this uh, snapshot from Inspire, from the recent Inspire search, many papers which address this problem, discuss various aspects of it. And again, there used to be a times prior to the start of the LHC when people thought they knew what the answer was. There were several kind of prominent frameworks which would say that, 
together with the Higgs boson at electronic scale, we will see many particles. And this framework was rich and uh, prolific and all the phenomena which I discussed now could have been embedded into this framework. It's supersymmetry or some other electronic scale new physics and it didn't show up at the HC. State of the, of the art today is that you see a lot of exclusions, various models, various channels are probed to TV scale, and yet there are no evidence for any of this electronic scale physics. And so this framework is maybe not gone, but challenged. And people became very much open to new ideas. Kind of paraphrasing on one of the theorists from CERN, prior to the LHC, we kind of, the community thought they knew what the road is to new physics. And today we are somewhere here. There is a land of uh, ideas, land of opportunities, if you wish. And they are all uh, of the same footing. There is no kind of prior, there's no bias apart from your personal interest. So it's a very interesting time in physics when everything is allowed. And when it's not a theory which drives the development of the field, but rather the experiment, we all wait for what new experiments will show to us. And that's an um, interesting time, challenging time. And for me, being a phenomenologist, a theorist, it's a time when I choose a model based on my taste, preference, intuition, and I work on it because trying to see whether it survives uh, the observations which we have uh, or will have in the future. And so this is a model which I want to talk to you about. So in this state of, the, of affairs, the question is, well, which road do I take? Again, it's a personal take. I'm, I don't want to make an impression that this is the model or that I don't believe that anything else is possible. But again, at some moment, you have to define what, decide what you're working on. That's my choice, and I hope I will convince you that it's appealing enough. So, let me, given that we have at least three Bielsen of model problems, uh, what would be the minimum number of particles that you need to identify this, uh, to resolve these problems? Well, let's start from the, the question okay. in the landscape of theoretical ideas do we have any indication as to where to go which scale to choose the answer is no the scales are enormous from tiny electron volt or even sub electron volt in case of dark matter scales to 10 to the 15 gv to the scales which are well beyond the reach of current or any foreseeable experiments. So you cannot say, let's explore this because this is a preferred place to look for. We don't know. And this vast um, range of scales, field of scales, it's very well indicated by the story of um, neutrino oscillations. So the fact that neutrino oscillate, what's neutrino? We know that electro, uh, the weak and electromagnetic forces are united into the electroweak symmetry. And in the unbroken phase, electron and neutrino are two components of the same double. And so you can rotate one into another. And it is a Higgs, which when it breaks electroweak symmetry to weak and electric, it actually tells you which of the two components of the doublet is electron and which one is neutrino. And so the interaction the neutrino masses, neutrino oscillations are actually an interaction between four particles, two lepton doublets in which neutrinos sit and two Higgs bosons. And there are many ways to resolve uh, this kind, this is a high dimension dimension five operator, Weinberg operator. And there are many ways to resolve this dimension five operator by introducing an extra particle which mediates it. It can be fermion, it can be scalar, it can be uncharged scalar, it can be charged scalar. And if you just look at the scale of this, which is just mass of, uh, of, of square root of uh, atmospheric neutrino mass difference divided by the Higgs wave, 
you will see a scale which is order of 10 to the 15 GV. And therefore, the first idea of um, a resolution of neutrino oscillation puzzle was with a very heavy extra neutrinos. But then people understood that actually there is no, this is a scale, but it's not a mass of the particle. So it's, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence, and to very much extent, not so. If you look at this in more details, here's your uh, dimension five operator resolved with a singlet fermion. The fact that it is singlet means non-charged with respect to the strong, weak, or electromagnetic field is dictated to you by the charges of the lab doublet and of the Higgs, which chooses for you what is neutrino, as I said. And given that it is um, singlet, you can not only couple it to the Higgs and to the left-handed neutrinos through usual Dirac interaction, but you can also write for it the Majorana master. The idea of Futura Majorana, which he introduced in searches to give mass to actual neutrinos, came back to us half a century later, because then people understood that um, this is a truly neutral particle, and only a truly neutral particle can uh, can have a Majorana mass because this Majorana mass violates any continuous symmetry. And so you Hello. have, yes. Uh, somebody has a question? Uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So uh, can I ask, where can I see the triplet formula in type 3C cell? Uh, I, I don't see any triplet formula there. Uh, the triplet formula is, is here. So what you have, you have, um, you have a triplet, uh, SU2 triplet, this is the SU2 triplet. So you have an SU2 triplet and two SU2 doublets. Uh, you can think about the SU2 triplet as the kind of a joint matrix. And so you have two, two two-dimensional vectors and one matrix which couples them. Okay, so sorry, can, I, uh, can, can you explain the difference between the triplet scalar in type 2 C cell? Uh, so, so the triplet is inside the uh, propagator. Yes, they're always inside the propagator, but their mass is different. The, their statistics is different. And if you would try to, if you would try to write, um, to write the mass term, you need to ensure that you build a scalar and you need to ensure that you build scalar in terms of the Lorentz transformation and scalar in terms of the SU2 transformation. Okay, I see. Thank and, and so you have triplet for the SU2, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you need two fermions, one scalar. And so these and these are two different choices. I see. How you can combine SU2 triplet. Again, you can think about this as a Pauli matrices times three fermions of scalars, mm. Pauli in the either spin in the SU2 space. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, but coming back to the CISO type one, where is this fermion is singlet, which seems to be, again, it's not, as, as you see, there are many choices and which one brings its own observables and its own uh, ways to probe it and its own predictions. So even in this naively simplest model, you will see that the phenomenology is very rich. So what happens here? You have a particle, which is charged, at which carries no charge, and it has Dirac mass and Majorana mass. And there is a philosophical question of what you call a particle. And is particle something that propagates in a definite way, or is particle something that interacts in a definite way? And very often for photons, electrons, etc., you don't have to worry about this question because they coincide. The one who, who propagates and the one who interacts. Here, this is not the case. There is a charged state, which I just described. It has zero charge, it's a sterile state. But it doesn't propagate. This state by itself does not obey the Klein-Gordon equation, or Dirac equation, of which the Klein-Gordon is a consequence. But you can diagonalize it, defining definite propagation states, mass eigenstates. In which case, you will see that your theory contains actually two particles, light but not massless fermion, which is not its charge eigenstate, and therefore there are oscillations. And also heavy, if your 
mass of your of your right right handed component of your singlet fermion is much bigger than the Dirac mass, uh, which carries some charges I will show you. And because of this formula, the mass of neutrinos is the Dirac mass times the ratio. You see that you can play the game of changing both Dirac and Majorana mass and getting the same neutrino masses. And this mass may be of electroweak scale, in which case the denominator will be 10 to the 15 GeV, or this mass can be at some electro, sub electron volt, in, 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 this, in which case this will be tiny. And this can be anything in between. So this, that's why I say that neutrino masses do not predict any scale and can be from electron volts to 10 to the 15 GeV. But so what, what's important is that there are two particles here, and there is Majorana mass of neutrino, with all this phenomenology, neutrinos, etc. And there is also another particle. And if I identify the dimensionless number, which is called mixing angle, which is Dirac over Majorana mass, or if you wish, which is mass of the neutrino over of this Dirac mass, then this propagating state is usually called sterile neutrino or heavy neutral lepton, HNL, or Majorana fermion, or heavy Majorana fermion, or right-handed neutrino. There are many names, and depending on which branch of particle physics you are sitting, different names are considered more standard. But what's important about it? It's a heavy neutral lepton. It's a heavy cousin of a neutrino. It behaves like a neutrino. It interact, if I speak about mass eigenstate, again, there is a charge eigenstate, which is sterile, doesn't interact, but it mixes with neutrino, or there is mass eigenstate, which doesn't mix with anything, but it interacts with W, with Z, with Higgs, and it interacts in a way similar to the way neutrinos interact, but with, with the weak coupling constant suppressed by some small dimensionless number, which is actually flavor dependent. I'm going to put flavor mix here but uh, it's electron muon or tau, and there are three mixes here. So it's uh, the type one you saw, the introduction of the singlet right-handed fermions into the Lagrangian, leads phenomenologically to appearance of new particles whose mass is a free parameter of your theory, and whose interaction strength is free parameter of your theory because it's weak-like, but suppressed. So sometimes we call it feebly interacting particles or super weakly interacting particles. Uh, and this phenomenology is, in a sense, very simple. It participates in all the interactions, in all the reactions in which usual neutrino would participate, if kinematics allowed, and it's, their interaction is suppressed by this number, by the mixing angle. So for example, W decays to muon and neutrino, or it can decay to the muon and sterile neutrino to the HNL, and the decay leads to the heavy neutral lepton is suppressed by square of the mixing angle, provided that the mass of HNL is much smaller than the mass of the W. Otherwise, there are corrections due to threshold. So, and that is kind of the simplest model of explaining neutrino mass installations. And as I will show you right now, it already brings a very rich phenomenology. Namely, like it's useful to have a feeling for what the level of the mixing is, this mixing angle, how tiny it is. And it's one trillion for if your HNL has a mass of 100 GV and the scale is one dollar mass. And if you look at this kind of space of neutrino masses versus mixing angles, then can be from electron volts to 15 GeV. And if there would be only one HNL in your theory, you would have this line along which the, the mixing angle follows mass. So no, you would, could assume the mass and predict the coupling constant. However, the story is not that simple because neutrino physics observe two mass splittings, called atmospheric and solar. They are different, but they are both non-zero which means that you would need at least two HNLs coupled in the same way, but now you have a matrix of your color couplings and the matrix of Majorana masses. And you need at least two to explain two mass differences. And this fact allows you to 
opens for you this whole white wedge, this whole white parameter space. So from here to up to there, anything is allowed. If you have two of them, because there are more parameters into each null model. If there are 11 parameters, and only seven can be restricted from neutrino data. So you have enough freedom to move your interaction strengths up and down. Okay, so two HNLs can snugly accommodate the neutrino oscillations for any neutrino data, including CP phase, which is not measured for any neutrino mass ordering. However, the interesting, this idea goes back to late, seven, late 70s. In 80s, people understood that actually the same particles can be responsible for generation of the baryon signature of the universe. In 90s, they understood that they can be responsible for generation of baryon signature of the universe with a mass much smaller than 10 to the 15 GeV. At the order of GeV or TeV, there are different models. In also in 90s, they understood that light heavy neutral lattice are responsible for, maybe responsible for dark matter. I'll speak more about this. And um, 15 years ago, in 2005, Taki Asaka and Misha Shapochnikov understood that actually you can combine all of this into one model. And this model will require for you three heavy neutral atoms. So, which is nice because you have three left-handed neutrinos and you can add to your model three right-handed neutrinos. By the way, this is not required. You can add one, two, three, five, or 17 neutrinos to the model and still have all those neutrino phenomenology, of course, with a lot of free parameters. So the number of right-handed neutrinos don't have to be the same as number of left-handed neutrinos. However, if it is, surprisingly, you can fit into the same model, choose a parameter in such a way that you can get neutrino mass and installation, baryon asymmetry of the universe, and dark matter. This model is called new MSM, neutrino minimal standard model. And this is, it is this model which I'm going to talk about later. It's one of the choices of parameters for the type one SSO with a single right-handed neutrino. And that's a very interesting choice of parameters. And already here, you still have a lot of freedom, surprising as it is in, in such an con, con constraint model. So let me speak about this a little bit. Uh, to produce baryonous image of the universe, you should have also two heavy neutral leptons. Uh, they can be the same heavy neutral leptons which generate for you neutrino mass and oscillations. So this is their mass and this is their interaction strength. And they should be degenerate in mass. Their mass difference should be much smaller than their mass. How much smaller depends. There is a wide space of parameters. This is delta M or various masses, and you see that there are about 10 orders of magnitude in, in splitting. This is, this is the region where you can generate, successfully generate the baryon symmetry of the universe. And this is the area of research. And there are those long list of names and long list of references. Half of them are actually eaten, sorry. You can look at this paper. It discusses all the previous works. So you can look there and see the comparison. But what you do essentially, you have two HNLs, they almost degenerate in mass. When they oscillate in the early universe, they do it in the CP violating manner. And in this way, they produce leptin asymmetry, which is then gets transformed, transformed into the baryon asymmetry by spherules. And given that their masses are within the range well accessible to all accelerators, but their interaction strength is very feeble. The question is, can we search for such particles? And let me now discuss where this particle can be searched and then move to the question of dark matter. So can this particle, these two HNLs with GV scale masses be discovered? So two particles nearly degenerate in mass. How can you do it? Short answer, yes, they can. They can be discovered at future rounds of the Large Hadron Collider or at many so-called intensive frontier experiments. And what I show you here, I don't show you any specific details. What I want you to see, all the open contours are future experiments. These ones are related to the Large Hadron Collider. These ones are related to future non-LHC searches. And the interesting thing is here is how crowded this plot is. How, like, in the ideal world, well, all the experiments that we want to build are built. And these are all experiments which are possible, okay? It's not like uh, 10 to 15 GV collider. It's, 
future circle collider uh, larger version of flap which is challenging than doing low probably you can explore a significant part of the parameter space of the heavy neutral lactant model and because of that and because of the interest to this model the HNL so today is a part of the search program for all major particle physics experiments whether existing like harmonious LHC or plant when you discover a particle there is no name tag attached to it however if you look at the parts and if you discover sufficiently many events by looking at the various branching ratios of the way it decays to leptons or to leptons plus mesons by looking at the ratio of the branching fractions you can determine whether you discovered a scalar or a fermion so in the case to two fermions or three fermions you can restore its mass or season certainly kind of demon channels um, have broad distribution. So you can figure out that, okay, I discovered the particle, this is a fermion. Its uh, decay patterns are consistent with having neutral left. And its mass, if I am lucky enough to measure like decay of H now to neuron plus pi, on very nice particles from experimental point of view can be determined with sufficiently good, sufficiently good precision. Okay, I have done that. What's next? Actually, the interesting thing is that if tomorrow LHC discovers such particle, this will mean that they discovered two such particles, not one. Why? Because as I told you, if you would have only one HNL, it's uh, mixing as a function of its mass would be sitting on this lower boundary, which means that for the 10 GV HNL, you would be probing, the, you would need to probe mixing at the level 10 to the minus 11. Typical bounds today are at the level 10 to the minus five. And LHC may go to 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine. To sit so much above the CISO line, the bottom line, you need to have two HNLs who should be almost degenerate in mass. Then big enough mixing does not lead to big neutrino masses. Because otherwise, if you just scale the thing up, mass of neutrino scales up. And this starts to be incompatible with neutrino data. However, if there are several particles that are sufficiently close in mass, they cancel each other's contribution to the neutrino masses, but they don't cancel their contribution to the decay events at the LHC. And so, essentially, if you discover HNL at LHC tomorrow, you discover two for the price of one, which is nice. And yes, there's a whole discussion about this cancellation by Miss Shapshitz and by Karsten and Smirnov. Now, Once you determine the H and L, you can study them in various channels. There are many complementary experiments. You can, you can do the studies and you can actually measure not only masses, not only total lifetime, but also various branching fractions. So you can determine with certain precision even uh, the flavor mixing angles. Then you ask yourself, okay, uh, are this really the Majorano particles I was looking for? What does it mean to be a Majorano particle? Well, to be a Majorana particle is, means to violate lepton number. Formerly, heavy neutral lepton is a lepton, so it carries a lepton number. However, as I said, the Majorana mass prohibits any global symmetry, and lepton number is a global continuous U1 symmetry, right? And so, if uh, my HNLs exist, then they can be produced in lepton number conserving events, like this one, W is equal to mu to HNL. HNL decays to another muon, but of a different sign, and then positron and electron neutral. So lepton number is conserved here. Okay, uh, if you look at the, this decay channel, the station is different from, because both of your muons are mu pluses, and then the electron is E minus, and uh, neutrino is anti -neu electron anti neutrino. But this is because this particle. What does it mean to be a Majorana particle? It means that you can decay to something it to, and also to the charge conjugated something. So here HNL decays to W plus and mu minus, and here the same HNL decays to W minus of shell W minus and mu plus. That's what Majorana is. It's kind of two different helicity states, to be precise. And there are many works which discuss how to study this at the LHC. Why you want to study this at the LHC? Because Lepton number violating processes are not part of the standard model, otherwise. 
and they, their backgrounds are greatly suppressed. And so you have much cleaner signatures, unfortunately. Uh, the same story which cancels the contribution of several HNLs to neutrino masses also cancels leptin number violation. If you think because neutrino mass is my run neutrino mass, the contribution to it and contribution to leptin number violating process is of the same footing as discussed again by the same people. So, on the one hand, this doesn't seem to be a very promising direction. However, if you think about this more, it turns out that because your two HNLs may not be of the same mass, but can be almost degenerate, so their mass may be very close, one per million, one per million, but not exact. And in this case, not only they are produced, they can oscillate in flight, they are long-lived particles. And this opens for you certain ranges of parameter space where you can see both lepton number violating and lepton number conserving properties. And more, moreover, if you measure enough of them, you can actually see the rate, the duration is proportional to the mass difference times the lifetime. In the decay with its lifetime, as discussed, for example, in this paper. And which opens for you a nice possibility to search at the LHC not only for Myran or HNLs, but also to measure in sort of a range of parameter space, at least their mass splitting. So you're getting one more prediction out of those which you want to measure. And what's more interesting, you can not do it not only at the LHC, but also with other experiments like the experiment called SHIP, one of the hypothetical intensity frontier experiments where particles are produced at the target, fly 70 meters, and then decay in a long decay vessel. And there you can literally see neutrino oscillations. If you have enough events, or you sit somewhere here, and that's the parameter space where a ship would be able to probe. So it goes to 10 to the minus 10 also, almost for small masses. And if you are one to the magnitude above, you have hundreds of events. You can bin them in their proper time, and you can literally see traces of oscillations of such particles. And from the period of this oscillation, you will measure the mass splitting. So in the in certain worlds, you will be able, like within five years from now, when ship will be operational, you will be able to measure both HNLs and their mass splitting, their oscillations. There are no good ideas so far how to measure CP violations in the HNL sector. That's left for the future. So in, in short, accelerator measurements complementary to each other, LHC, non-LHC experiments, and all together they can, they can determine the heavy neutral leptons responsible for baryogenesis and for neutrino oscillations and measure many of their, their properties to be confronted by theoretical predictions. However, let's now go to the question of um, HNL and dark matter. The idea, the idea of HNLs and dark matter, as I said, was developed in parallel to the ideas of HNLs and neutrino oscillations. And more or less, the um, line of reasoning is the following. People used to think that dark matter is neutrino because neutrino is neutral, stable, maybe have some small mass and is copiously produced in the early universe. You can, in every cosmology course, you do the computation that per flavor of neutrinos, you get 112 particles per cubic centimeter. However, if you ask yourself, what mass should my neutrinos have to explain all the dark matter abundance, you will see that the mass should be 11 electron volts, which is incompatible with what we know about neutrino masses today. You know, today's neutrino masses are below 0 0.2 electron volts, the sum of them, and that the electron neutrino is below 2 electron volts from direct measurements. And not only it's incons inc inconsistent with the measurements of neutrino masses, it's also inconsistent with the fact that neutrinos should be not only cosmological dark matter, dark matter which gives you the matter density of the universe, but also astrophysical dark matter, something which gives the mass to the galaxies. Because neutrinos are fermions, you have to have sufficiently many positions of the phase space to put them into the small galaxy. And the smaller is the mass of the particle, the bigger is, is the number to realize the same 
massive galaxy. And as it turns out, as was discovered by these people in 79, for any fermionic dark matter, your mass should be several hundred electron volts or more in order to not to violate the power exclusion principle when realizing small massive galaxies. And this bound, this is a lower bound, and this is the upper bound, and they are incompatible by factor of 30 or so. So from seven, late 70s, early 80s, people knew that neutrino dark matter is not really a, a dark matter candidate. So the only standard model particle is not a dark matter. And if you think about this, and if you move along this lines, you can say, okay, what went wrong? And you understand that for the Treman gun mass of few hundred MeV, your abundance number of particles was too large. What can reduce number of particles? One is making the particle heavy, then the decoupling relativistic, and their number density is not TQ, but it Boltzmann suppressed. That's what's called weakly interacting massive particle, or VIM. The first VIM of, VIM of Lee and Weinberg of Zildovich and company was actually exactly heavy, cosmologically heavy neutrino. At the time, there are no, no bounds to this. Your second alternative is to make neutrino super weakly interacting, sterile neutrino. In this way, they interact insufficiently strong, never enter thermal equilibrium, and so their abundance is sub-equilibrium. And your den energy density abundance is mass times number density abundance. So if you shrink the number density abundance, you can allow for larger mass. And that's what sterile neutrino dark matter is, as realized by Dudelson and Wintrow in 1993, and then by other people later on. Um, and again, here, I, I should say that there are, like, in particle physics, these particles are called heavy neutral leptons, and cosmologists, the same particles called usually sterile neutrinos, historic. And there is also electron volt sterile neutrino, which has nothing to do with the, with the story because it's not a dark matter. and uh, it's not a part of the biogenesis, so it's a completely different story. So electron volt sterile neutrino is our well, this force neutrino, which can explain LSND or mini boon or other anomalies. It's not in this picture. But here I will sometimes use the word sterile neutrino simply because for dark matter, that's the name. Okay. If my sterile neutrino is dark matter, then its mass can be light, but no less than have several hundred electron volts, half kV, order half kV. It can be light, it doesn't have to be, but it can be light. Its lifetime, it can actually decay. It can decay to three neutrinos, or it can decay to a neutrino and a photon through liquidated process. And surprisingly enough, requirement that this uh, particle is heavier than the lifetime of the universe is not enough. The fact that you have so many dark matter particles that, that even if they produce decay once per lifetime of the universe, you still have a very strong flux of X-rays that would come from any galaxy. Like if they would have a age of the universe lifetime, then Andromeda galaxy would be shining at one X-ray frequency with more brighter than the whole X-ray emission of Andromeda galaxy from astrophysics. And so, because of non-observation of this decay line, you can put a strong bound on on the interaction strength of strong neutrinos, the same mixing angle, as a function of mass. There is a, this is a, a large region. This car is cut by the uh, this power exclusion principle arguments, and this is cut from non observation of um, X ray emission. And this is the lifetime. And that's the contribution of the dark matter neutrino, neutrino with such a mass and coupling constant to the neutrino oscillation. So, Along this line, it contributes to the level of a solar, smaller neutrino mass difference. So everything below here gives you negligible contribution to neutrino mass. Uh, now, it should be said that if you want to search for KVs, Kiastral neutrinos, then even experiments like Katrin is not compatible with uh, X-ray bounds, because essentially Katrin operates with tiny amount of tritium and uh, galaxies like Milky Way has 10 to 70 dark matter particles of this mass. So your X-ray line searches become the dominant source of information about um, dark matter sterile neutrinos. 
This search has been conducted by many groups over many years, since beginnings of 2000. And surprising as it is for people who are not in the field, X-ray sky is very non-quiet sky. And there are many X-ray telescopes, all of them are satellite-based because X-rays don't penetrate the atmosphere. And if you look at what X-ray telescope measures, it mostly measures parasites, parasitic signal. Like this is the spectrum of typical XMM neutron. Okay? And every line here is not, a, is not an astrophysical line, it's a fluorescent line. A photon comes, hits your detector, it excites an electron just in the, in the material, then it gets remitted back, and it's a K-alpha of all the metals of which the satellite is made. And then there are other induced particles in the ground because of soft protons which heat the detector by passing the mirrors because of all sorts of stuff. So it's very complicated to search for a narrow line on top of the astrophysical emission. On top of this, most of your galaxy dark matter dominated objects are also X-ray active. Um, so, may, as I said, many people were doing this work for many years and given some recent developments, I should speak a, a little bit about the work which we did in 2014, when two groups, with an interval of one week, reported that they see a line at energy about 3.5 keV, which they cannot identify with any non-astronomical lines, and they think it's not systematics. And this line comes from a Pearson spectrum of dark matter dominated objects, galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And these are two independent words and two independent sets of data. And the question, of course, people became very excited because the question was, is this decaying dark matter finally discovered? And if so, then can this be probably sterile neutrino dark matter? One doesn't imply the other. It may be non dark matter signal, it may be dark matter signal, but no sterile neutrino dark matter, and it can be sterile neutrino dark matter. So what I, from, what I speak about from now on, it's not really about sterile neutrino dark matter, it's about this decaying 3.5 keV line, which can be interpreted as, in, as any of your favorite models. Uh, a lot of interest this subject has generated. Many subsequent works has discovered this the same signal in other types of uh, dark matter dominated objects. Other groups did not find anything, challenged what they saw. Some people explain this systematic, some people explain that this is astrophysics. There are several reviews which I would recommend for you to read. And this is a plot made by Kefa Bazajan, which more or less tells you the story. So there are a lot of detections. These are the shaded one, two, and three sigma uh, regions. And there are various non detections which put certain bounds. So everything above any line is excluded. And it looks messy and it's, you see that things are roughly consistent after, and of course you shouldn't take all this one to three sigma bounds like at face value. I mean, there are uncertainties. This is astrophysics. This is not a controlled experiment of particle physics yet. Uh, as we are today, this thing has been detected in many objects with significance from six, three sigma to four to five sigma. Like we all know that five sigma is discovery, is the fluctuation, but not in astrophysics. I mean, there are examples of five sigma detection in astrophysics is actually spurious because systematics is very hard to control. Speaking about systematics, something which is related to the structure of the detector. It has been observed with four different telescopes made of different materials. With in terms of mirrors, different materials in terms of detectors. It's not clear what systematics goes through all of these telescopes. People discuss this may be some astrophysical lines. Astroph astroph KV region is very astrophysically active and so pick any frequency within 100 electron volts, you will see some astrophysical transition. However, uh, one of the observations made by a satellite called Hitomi which was the only really high resolution satellite which ever flew it, or, or only existed for two weeks and it was malfunctioned and stopped working. It looked at the place where the emission was very strong and it didn't see any astrophysical lines there. And for this kind of uh, spectrometer, astrophysical line is narrow and the metal line is broad. And of course, it takes much more observational time to detect a broader line because it's smeared over more 
beans and so number of extra photons per bean is smaller. So if you look, for example, here, Hitomi did not, did only a small dent in dark matter interpretation of 3.5 kV line, but no doubt it's astrophysical origin. So it's not the statistical fluctuation, no systematics that we know of, no astrophysics. It may be a combination of those. If for, for each non-observation you will give some of, some of the three explanations, then you can combine things. But if you want to explain everything from one, then there is no convincing explanation what it is. Now, it's very difficult to roll out systematics when you work in uncontrolled environments like space. However, I understand that dark matter is universal. It's present in every galaxy, it's present in every cluster. There are uncertainties, but essentially if you see big enough sample of dark matter dominated objects, each of them exhibits a line with within needed uncertainties, then, then you have a reason to believe that you are discovering dark matter. And this is what you see here. You this axis is uncertainty in dark matter, in the projected dark matter mass along the line of sight. This uh, axis is predicted flux in the line which you see. This is a line of the constant lifetime. And you see that everything you detect roughly sits along the needed line. And you can go to simulations and you ask yourself, okay, given that I observe that signal in Andromeda and that signal in Milky Way, but different regions of those. How probable it is that they both come from dark matter decay. And this is distribution of the ratio of the fluxes, and this is where your detection sits. Clearly consistent with kind of dark matter predictions. And you can play this game for a long time. I mean, it's very hard to build, to prove things in this way, but it's a consistency check which you can constantly run. And a very important consistency check, and why I speak about this now, is that in the Milky Way, we are sitting eight kiloparsecs away from the galactic center. And dark matter galo is around us, halo is around us with a hundred kiloparsecs um, radius, hundreds of kiloparsecs radius. So when you sit inside the dark matter halo, no matter where you look, here, here, or here, you pick some dark matter signal, even if otherwise the sky is empty and there are no galaxies in the line of sight. So in principle, what you would like to do, you'd like to build a surface brightness profile of the line across the Milky Way sky, and then compare it to this prediction of dark matter distribution. And as usual, two groups have an idea, and then two papers appear within 10 days. And some of you may probably saw the press releases in March of this year when the first group got their paper of 2019 published in science, so it took a year and a half, which means never give up. And they did a very solid work. They demonstrated that you take enormously big data sets, 30 megaseconds, it's huge. They split it into the regions. They invented their own complicated statistical analysis, ignoring usual X-ray community standard fitting approach, because they have their reasons to believe that there are some systematics there. And at face value, they say they rule out the smallest dark matter signal predicted by other observations by a factor of about 10. Which, which is strong exclusion. At the same time, sitting on a very similar data, doing different statistical analysis, essentially standard in the community, we take comparable data set, we split into the six radial beams from center going outwards, and we detect the line at the same frequency in every beam for beans with three sigma significance to be or more than some even far from two beans with two plus sigma significance. That's your detection. Square root of this is your detection significance, roughly speaking. Okay, uh, so this is a line, and they don't. And the question is: our line compatible with the desert et al. exclusion? First of all, what does it mean this is a line? If we take our six regions with this line present, and then put its flux to zero, we ask yourself, okay, how big is the residual? This is the residual in terms of the standard deviations. You see about 100 standard, 100 standard deviations, so, sorry, square root of 100, so about 10 standard deviations away from zero. 
So the fact that your dark matter, that the line is not there, is very much impossible statistically. You may say, okay, you see this line in this bin, in this bin, in this bin, in this bin, in this bin. This is your predicted dark matter density profile. This is one, it's not a fit so far, just an exa uh, illustrative example. But, by, but taking the real dark matter density profile and connecting all the six regions according to the dark matter density profile, do you see the line? Yes, I do. I see the line there at seven sigma, or from six to seven sigma, no matter which profile I choose, actually. I mean, the significance varies, but not much, because all the profiles should roughly agree with each other in the region of, of degrees. And again, my resi stacked residual assuming NFW density profiles, again, a huge stack, around nine standard deviations. Of course, it's less when you interpret it as a two-dimensional parametric feed, etc. Now, is it compatible with astrophysical lines? There are other lines physical line like argon or calcium emission lines nearby. They behave with off centers of six regions. They fall off like that. This logarithmic scale, this is my, my line. And if you compare the radial profile slope, your astrophysical lines have the same roughly radial profile decay with off center distance. And your 3.5 kV lines is completely separate, much more sharp. And, and again, it's, again, this does not prove anything, right? But this is, serves as the another consistency check that we see something and the something doesn't behave like astrophysics. Now, what went wrong between us and Desert et al? We don't know because it's difficult to reproduce their procedures. There are some details that are not there, but we tried to do what they do. And essentially they tried to feed a very complicated background model on a narrow energy interval. And in this way, you can compensate the presence of the line by, by under subtracting the ground in one place and over subtracting it in another place. And we tried to repeat their exercise when the paper appeared, but also Kefab the John tried to do it independently of us. And this is more or less the bound which they get, very similar, and we reproduce it. But this is because they had model lines sitting here, these are three sigma residuals. And that model also lines sitting all, whose tails enter the region. The same technicalities for the interesting, I can speak more. So to make a long story short, we believe that if you do conservative bound in a method, method similar to theirs, you will get about order of magnitude weaker exclusion. And that's what Kev also concludes, who puts this desert et al bounds onto, their, onto his plot. And yeah, it's in some tension, but again, he will take a factor of you, having to do with the fact that you need somehow to account for the correct documentary abundance and so on. So, regardless of what you read about recent stats 3.5 kV line, I believe that this line is there. I see a strong line. I see this line behaving as documentary profile predicts. Of course, it's always challenging to explain why other people got different results and that may indicate some flow in our analysis, but we don't understand where it is. And it may be also flow in their analysis. So that's the status for now. And of course, only the future will tell. Uh, at some moment, the satellites which can resolve this line and not mix it with nearby astrophysical lines will fly, like this few, poor Hitomi, which will be replaced in 2021-22. And then we will finally know the truth. And if it is a dark matter line, then the cosmology of, of the 20s, 2020s will be completely different because we will start to do the dark matter astronomy and that's my tomography, and it will be very exciting. Uh, I will need to finish in a couple of minutes, so one, one last thing. Uh, because your dark matter particles are light, they relativistic in the early universe. They move around and they smooth the primordial inhomogeneities. And so at small scales, you should see the less structures in strong neutrino dark matter universe than in the cold dark matter universe which means that in the Lyman Alpha forest, your absorption spectra has less features. It's a small difference like between the orange and blue. So blue have slightly more features than orange. You, see there is a, you can understand that orange is certain light smoothing of blue on this plot. But this difference is small. And if you look at the modern day, data of Lyman Alpha forest, and I speak, can speak more about this in the question uh, section, then you see that actually, 
And this is completely by accident because there is no a priori reason why the 3.5 kV line should have a correct clustering properties is independent. Only within the sterile neutrino documented model, these things are related. It turns out that the same sterile neutrino documented model, which would fit 3.5 kV signal, also is the best fit for the Lyman lava flow state. It may be accidental, there are things to discuss here, but of course it keeps your spirits up. Okay, let's, we started five minutes after the hour, so I should finish probably. So, I promised for you to build uh, a unified model of particle physics and cosmology. And more or less, in my view, this is a model. Standard model, plus three right-handed neutrinos can incorporate for you neutrino oscillations, dark matter, origin of, of, bi of baryonic matter. It can be testable at cosmic frontiers, at uh, particle physics frontiers. That's why I like it and work on it. So. Thank you for your attention. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. It's uh, a lot of information, interesting and <laughs> mind bogging. So anyway, um, this is the time we uh, could go to questions. So if uh, anybody in the audience has questions, please raise your hand in the participant section or let me know in the chat. Uh, while people are thinking about their questions, I was actually uh, wondering myself about one thing uh, concerning the ship experiment. So what is the current status of that? If it's in the progress of being built or what's, what's happening? Okay. Well, uh, as, you, as you on the source, ship, if built, would be an experiment built on CERN. It would be Experiments sitting on the, let me see, I probably have a slide for it. Experiment. Yeah, so there is a, in turn, there is a thing called super proton synchrotron. It's one of the previous generation's uh, experiments and it accelerates proton to 400 GeV before they are injected into the LHC ring. And most of these protons are not used by the LHC. However, the intensity not their energy, but their intensity is enormous. It's the highest intensity, high energy, highest energy intensity beam in the world. And so such an experiment would need to be built in CERN. And this experiment needs to be included into the European particle physics strategy update, which is going on right now. It has not been done yet. And if the strategy update will say that, okay, such experiments should be built, then CERN management will kind of let us to go forward. We have kind of come, so there are certain stages of preparing experiment. We have completed all the stages, which we can do now, and we are waiting for the CERN management to give, or not to give us approval to move on to the next stage, to the, to the so-called so TDR, technical design report stage. In which case, if this happens around 2026, the experiment could start. So we would, we think if, if approved, but of course experiment of such level is not approved by CERN at all. It, uh, alone, it should be approved by larger scientific community. I see. I see. Okay, um, any other questions from the audience? I don't wanna hijack this all by myself, although I do have plenty of questions there I could ask if needed. <laughs> um, I don't see any raised hands. Either everybody is still sleepy, already sleepy. Okay, go <laughs> ahead, Tanmay. Tanmay, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Oleg. Uh, Nice talk. Uh, Thanks. I might have missed it because I was having a few, uh, some internet problems. Could you say something about lepto? Is it leptogenesis that you're doing? Yes. So um, there are the these kind of HNLs. They are light. Therefore, they cannot produce lepton asymmetries in the usual way by just CP violating decays, as heavy HNLs could do. 
jo you covers are too small. What they do, they do so-called um, retrogenesis through oscillations, which works in the following way. Uh, maybe I have a slide here. So you produce an HNL, you produce a lepton, it produces an HNL, HNL flies and oscillates and can produce another lepton. In this way, you violate lepton number, lepton flavor number, but don't violate the total lepton number. Hmm. However, because your oscillations are actually CP violating, they can be CP violating. That's a requirement for for uh, for this new model to be a biogenesis model. In this case, you can also produce total lepton number. So you produce a particle, you oscillate, produce another particle, which is actually an antiparticle. In this way, you violate the lepton number and you generate it. Hmm. It builds up. Hmm. Sphalerons can convert into the baryon asymmetry, usual story. Hmm. And in this way, you can produce the baryon asymmetry of the universe in a very wide range of uh, mixing angles. If, you, if your coupling constant is too high, like here, then you enter equilibrium before the sphaleron frees out and you give back all the baryon asymmetry you produced. If hmm. your coupling constant is too small, I mean, you're still proportional to the Yukawas, although with some enhancement from the resonant uh, oscillations, uh, then you just don't produce enough. But there is a several orders of magnitude wide region where you can produce enough uh, baryon syndrome symptoms, given some other parameters which are not constrained by experiments or by neutrino data. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other new hands. So, um, well, for the sake of it, since uh, nobody's interested, I am. Um, in, uh, in these models with uh, sterile neutrinos, uh, well, this is uh, like one of the models uh, that is to replace the previously thought uh, supersymmetric models to work, and they apparently there is no trace of them. So sort of it's two-sided question. Is there any connection to the potential supersymmetry? And of course, if not, then the next natural question is, is there some sort of natural unification like uh, the supersymmetry was uh, praised for the ability to unify couplings, to unify everything and maybe re reduce or remove the hierarchy problem. Is there something like that with this uh, sterile neutrinos? Okay, so several things here. First, um, in this model, uh, the top is the heaviest particle, and then Higgs and then everything else. H and L are lighter than W. So in this model, there is no Higgs hierarchy problem because there are no heavy particles in the loop which give quantum corrections to the Higgs. So it's essentially your effective potential is the effective potential of the standard model which people have computed and know how it runs. So per se, there is no hierarchy problem here. The question you may ask here is the question like why is gravity stands to 19 GeV Planck scale and you see the electronic scale of 100 GeV. But that's a different story. And there are some answers to this question but they are outside the scope of this talk. Now, uh, supersymmetry, I mean, of course you can super supersymmetrize in MSM, but there is no reason for that. It doesn't do you any good. And as you probably know, when you deal with supersymmetry, yes, it you buys you something, but it also need to be very careful because a generic uh, supersymmetric model would be ruled out by observations many, many long time ago, right? You need a very specific corners of the big parameter space of supersymmetric models to be consistent with the data, flavor, and, and so on. So here again, you don't, it doesn't give you any benefits because all the BSM problems are solved, but it gives you troubles. So. I mean, of course, nature may be very ironic, sarcastic here, ironic, I don't know, but... Well, I'm not to protect the supersymmetric yeah. model as sort of like, mm -hmm. that was one of the driving forces for a while, and I'm just trying to see what's replacing yeah. it. So, uh, for, for the ground unification, no, the coupling constant here run exactly as in the standard model, so they don't meet. Then the question is, what is UV completion of the theory? And it takes a little bit outside uh, this field of kind of phenomenological physics in which I was sitting so far. 
Uh, in principle, you can organize ground unification in standard model like series if you allow yourself a certain high dimension operators, which are Planck suppressed. Interesting thing that Planck suppressed high dimension operators can organize for you the ground unification. And then the question is, why do you believe that Planck suppress is okay and not Planck suppress? I mean, we enter into the very kind of speculative realm and we can talk about this, but this is definitely not a colloquial style discussion. Okay, okay. That, that's fair enough. So if you're interested, I can, I don't have references in this uh, presentation, but this work has been done by people, by Shaposhnikov and company. Okay, sounds good.